want to introduce our guest speaker who we're very fortunate to have and is perfect for this topic. Dr. Londa Schiebinger is the John L. Hines Professor of History, History of Science, excuse me, at Stanford and Director of Gendered Innovations in Science, Health and Medicine, Engineering and the Environment. She's an international expert on sex and gender in science. She's had multiple invitations to speak at places like the United Nations, at Harvard. She received her PhD from Harvard. She's an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the recipient of numerous prizes and awards, including the Guggen a Guggenheim Fellowship. And from 2018 to 2020, she directed a large project in collaboration with the European Commission on Gendered Innovations, How Inclusive Analysis Contributes to Research and Innovation. Thank you very much. Thank you to no Noel for connecting me to Londa and thank you Londa for being here today. We'll turn it over to you. So it's a pleasure to be with you today. We're going to explore gendered innovations and how this global project can help overcome the gender harms in our world. Doing research wrong costs lives and money. For example, 10 drugs were withdrawn from the US market because of life-threatening health effects and eight of those posed greater threats for women. Not only did these drugs cost billions of dollars to develop, but when they fail, they cause human death and suffering. We can't afford to get it wrong. But doing research right can save lives and money. And I like this because this is, involves quantitative, you know, so numbers to make sure we think it's true. So an analysis of, the, uh, analysis of the US Women's Health Initiative Hormone Therapy Trial, which was a large NIH trial done in the 1990s, found that for every dollar spent, $140 were returned to taxpayers in healthcare savings. The study also saved lives. There were 76 fewer cases of cardiovascular disease, 126,000 fewer breast cancers, 145,000 more quality adjusted life years. And the downside is that there were more osteoporotic fractures. But again, I like these kinds of metrics because it shows in a different way how it matters. There are many reasons why drugs fail and fail more often for women. And one reason is that most research is still done in males, whether humans, animals, or cells and tissues. So this study was done in 2011 by some of our colleagues at Berkeley, but it, it's just, I have this nice graphic. The data really hasn't changed as much as we would hope. So this was done in 2011. The blue here shows that males are used more than females in all areas except for reproduction and immunology. But what I'm interested in is the gray part, and that's where the sex of the animal is not recorded. This is research money wasted. You might as well throw it out the window. So a similar study was done by colleagues at Mayo Clinic on cells and tissue, cells and tissues also in 2011. And look at the gray area. The sex of the cell is almost never recorded. And again, this is research money wasted. So now I want to go to some examples of how sex and gender analysis enhances the quality of biomedicine. And my first example comes from cells and tissues. So we know that stem, cells, stem cell research is important. And why might the sex of the cell be relevant? Research shows that there are sex differences in the therapeutic capacity of stem cells. So this slide simply shows that in muscle tissue, the female cells are more regenerative or active than the male cells. Yet very few researchers consider the sex of the cell, which can lead to failed research. An international team from Norway and Australia worked with stem cells in mice, and they appropriately used male and female mice. So using both animals of both sexes is good basic design, but they used all female stem cells, and this was an unconscious and arbitrary decision. It means that in the discovery phase, they did not see anything unique to male stem cells, 
nor did they detect important differences in the function between male and female cells. The result of not considering the sex of the stem cell was that their male mice died and they didn't know why. They thought maybe a postdoc made a mistake, when in doubt, blame the postdoc. But eventually, through a gendered innovations workshop in Norway, the team realized that they should also consider the sex of the stem cell. And they found that important for their project was matching donor and recipient. And they found that male to male and female to female was the best match that yielded the best results. But of course, you have to consider all of the possibilities before ruling anything out. out. But what I wanna talk about now is the sex interaction between the animal and the sex of the researcher. This is not a gender issue, this is a sex issue. An important study by Sorg et al. discusses the impact of experimenter sex. The example focuses on pain research. So the researchers induce pain in the rats and mice, but what they found is amazing. They found that the rats and mice don't show their pain to men researchers. Now, this is really important because the researchers are studying sex differences in pain response. So the animals don't show their pain when a man is in the room as compared to an empty room, but they do show their pain when a woman is in the room. So female sex. So then they tried, they found this was really interesting and important. This came out of Jeff Mogul's lab in Canada. So they tried all sorts of conditions. They tried a man in the room. They tried a woman in the room, an empty room, a chair in the room, um, you know, just anything to see what it was really. So the researchers identified this as the male observer effect. What's going on? It's not how the researchers act or how they handle the animals. Sometimes that's an issue, but what is it? The animals smell the men. They smell male pheromones. And according to Jeff Mogul, whose lab this came out of, this phenomenon throws into question all prior research from uh, or results from pain research. So a very important interaction here. Importantly, sex and gender interact, and let's see how this works in studies of pain. Pain has both biological aspects, there are sex differences in electrical, ischemic, thermal pressure and muscle pain sensitivity, and pain also has cultural aspects gender factors in how people report pain and how physicians understand and treat pain in patients. So let's look first at the sex differences in, in pain. The story is shown here in this lovely um, illustration from Nature. So researchers first described the pain pathway in mice and discovered, they're trying to get the, understand the pain pathway in the brain. How do you go from uh, the sensation to, to understand your body, understanding the sensation of pain? And they're defining the, the pathway. And here they find that the microglia is the main story. But then of course, they realized they'd only tested that in males. So they thought, okay, before we try to publish this, we should look at females. And they were shocked that the microglia doesn't really play a role, but the whole story is about T cells. So you might say that there's a male pathway of pain in the brain and a female pathway of brain, but not so fast. Other factors determine the pathway, such as age and hormone levels. So for example, males who lack, lack testosterone, so let's say older males, often switch over to this female pathway and females uh, who are pregnant, which I'm not sure how that works, but they switch over more to the male pathway. So it's not just a binary. So let's move on to another example, quickly to medical devices and take another kind of bias in this case, skin tone. So pulse oximeters that have been so important during COVID 
don't accurately report oxygen saturation levels in people with darker skin. So why is that? Pulse oximeters measure oxygen in the blood. And the problem is that the device, which uses a, a near infrared um, laser, does, does not measure the, the oxygen saturation properly because both the deoxyhemoglobin and in the blood and the melanin in the skin both absorb light. And this has been known since 1989, but not corrected. So an analysis of over 47,000 readings done in 2020 at the height of the pandemic found that oximeters misread the blood gases 12% of the time in patients with darker skin compared to 4% of the page, uh, time in patients with lighter skin. This means that patients with darker skin may not get the supplemental oxygen needed in order to avoid damage to vital organs, such as hearts, brains, lungs, and kidneys. But then what about sex? There was a study in 2007 that suggested that pulse oximeters don't work as well for women or anyone with smaller fingers. And in the 2020 study of 47,000 patients, it wasn't reported in the study, so I emailed uh, the primary um, author, and they found a slight sex difference. So I think we should beginning, begin to analyze how skin tone might intersect with sex to see if women with darker skin are most at risk. So what I've said about pulse oximeters is also true for consumer wearables. Again, these devices won't work well for users with darker skin. So this is the Apple Watch, the Fitbit, and other wearables collect a wealth of health-related information, including oxygen levels, uh, sleep, heart rate, arrhythmias. Um, and this is data that I know at Stanford, we're using a lot in health research because they like to, to use large populations and then see how these kind of basic data relate to um, health outcomes. So I know that, um, so the problem with these devices that use infrared, green, or you know infrared, red, or green light signaling is that these signals interact with the skin pigmentation and the accuracy may vary with skin tone. So it means that this basic data collection will be flawed. Now this can be important when we apply machine learning to a biased data set. For all AI and machine learning, creating the proper data set is an important first step. Often data sets are unrepresentative. Most overrepresent white males. In a study of digital biomarkers for Parkinson's disease collected from smartphones, found that only 18.6% of those data were from women. So if an algorithm is trained on a data set over representing male patients, it may lead to better detection of symptoms frequently manifest in men, such as rigidity and rapid eye movements, but not those typical of women. So I could give many examples. We have 40 case studies on our website. Designing sex and gender analysis into research is one crucial component contributing to world-class science and technologies. So eyes have been opened and we can't return to a world that ignores gender. Innovation is what makes the world tick. And as I hope I've begun to show, gendered innovation sparks creativity by offering new perspectives, posing new questions, and opening new areas to research. Can we afford to ignore such possibilities?